You are listening to the podcast of New Life Church in Wayland, Michigan. Our longing is to see zero people in our community living unchanged by Jesus. We are a church navigating the messiness of life together in community. One of our core convictions is that everyone is welcome, no one is perfect, and anything is possible. I hope you know there is a place in the family for you here. For more information on gathering times and location, check out our website. But for now, I hope God speaks powerfully to you through this word. Well, good morning. How is everyone doing this morning? Three of us are good. Awesome. I love it. So we're starting a new series today called The Captive Liberator. And uh, if you look at the, the Christmas story and really Jesus' own description of his ministry, one of the things that he said, I'm just going to get rid of that there. <laughs> we keep it real around here, okay? Uh, one of the things that he actually described his ministry, or the purpose of his ministry as, is to set the captives free. And uh, we really believe that the incarnation or the arrival of Jesus is him actually getting in the prison cell of our own sin and our own shame and unlocking it from the inside out. And so that's really the theme of this December, this Christmas series, is this idea that Jesus offers us freedom. And so I want to begin by just asking you this question. When was the last time that you had to put on a happy face? Maybe for some of us, it was this morning, (laughs) right on the way here. When was the last time that you had to put on a happy face? I want to take you back to this past Easter, uh, because holidays are a little bit, like the big Christian holidays, Christmas and Easter, they're a little bit complicated uh, being like in a pastor's family and stuff. And so this past Easter, about seven months ago, man, was it a weekend for my family, Uh, My wife, Sam, who's actually at home sick with the kids today, she was on the worship team. Uh, We had a good Friday service. There was Easter morning. It was all of the things, okay? And so Thursday night, she's at a rehearsal. Friday night, we have a a big good Friday service. Some of you were at that, and I'm doing one of the speaking portions there, so I have responsibilities there. And then comes Saturday. Okay, so I'm working on my Easter sermon that Saturday morning. And Sam decides to go to the grocery store to pick up a few things for the the weekend. And uh, she decided to bring all three kids with her to the grocery store. Mistake number one, right? (laughs) And so she brings the kids to the grocery store, and they are normal kids at the grocery store wanting everything, you know, the Fruity Pebbles and the the sugar, the Oreos, all of the stuff. And and, and by the time she, like, kind of wrangles them along the way, she's, she's grabbing a bottle of wine at the very end, and she puts it in the cart, and it just shatters on the floor all over the place, right? And, and I just, I picture this scene of like, and we laugh about it now, it was not funny when it happened, okay? But the picturing the scene of a mom alone with three kids and a shattered bottle of wine on the floor, is that not like the most ironic thing ever? The, the problem is like the grocery store workers all around her started laughing at her. I was like, you jerks, okay? And so on the way home, there were definitely some tears, and so that was, that was part one of Saturday. Part two of Saturday came in the afternoon when we began to realize that we're, there were some little specks in one of our kids' hair on their head. And so we started, you know, kind of looking and discovered that there was lice all over one of our kids' heads. And then we noticed that same thing on the second child. And then the third child. And all three kids, that Saturday afternoon, we discovered, mind you, this is the day before Easter, okay, had head lice. And so I'm running back to the same exact grocery store that Sam was just at that morning to get nicks or whatever you do to to treat lice. The kids are stripping down. They're weeping. They're crying. They're they're like freaking out. Like, we're going to have to shave our heads and quarantine for five days. It's like, that's COVID protocol, okay? You don't have to quarantine that long for lice. And so they're getting stripped down, they're in the bathtub, I get home with the lice shampoo, and our whole Saturday afternoon slash evening is spent de-licing our child's heads. But what's one of the most important things that you have to do when you have lice in your home is wash your sheets, right? And so we gather up all of the sheets that Saturday night, ready to wash them, throwing them in the washing machine, and all of a sudden we realize our washing machine is completely busted. It's broken. And by the time we got our kids in bed that night, on that Saturday before Easter, we were just sitting on the couch thinking to ourselves, I think anybody would notice if we didn't show up tomorrow. 
Like, I don't, I don't want to put on a happy face. I don't want to go to church tomorrow. I mean, we felt like, in some ways, prisoners in our own home, but it's, it's fine. We're all fine. Everything is fine, right? And we showed up, and it was an amazing Easter Sunday. But have you ever had those moments where the outward decorations don't match the inward realities? Whether it's a happy face or a mask that you wear or some kind of pretense. I think all of us have outward decorations that conflict in some way or another with our inward realities. And the holidays have a really, really effective way of kind of bringing all of that to the surface, right? Eat, drink, and be merry. And go to a family gathering that you don't want to be at. And buy gifts for people that you don't like. And go into debt and all of these things. And we spend so much time on the outward decorations of the season. And yet for so many of us, our inward realities feel like a jail cell. They feel like a prison. But this isn't just a holiday thing, right? We do this, we do this all year round. Like maybe for you, it's, it's image. That, that your outward decorations, you invest so much time in your image. Right? I, I just read a stat this last week that there are 92 million selfies posted every single day on social media. Right? The average person takes 5 to 15 shots of themselves before they find one they want to post. 90% of them that are posted have some kind of filter or massive edit on them because our outward decorations conflict with our inward realities, right? Like for some of us, we want to maintain this idea of image, and yet below the surface, there's a whole lot of shame and low self-worth. Now, maybe you're sitting there thinking to yourself, maybe you're a guy here, and you're thinking to yourself, well, I've never taken a selfie in my life. To that, I would say, yes, you have. <laughs> Let's be honest. How many of us have posted that picture of that eight-point buck or ten, I don't even know what it would be, ten-point buck, would that be a good one? I've gone hunting one time, okay? And uh, it's just a way that we brag to our neighbor, how many of us have bought a truck to distract ourselves from our broken marriage, right? We all live in this tension of outward decorations conflicting with inward realities. We all do it. We do it in the area of image. We do it in the area of identity. We do it in the area of accumulation, of approval. And this is not a new thing. I mean, even like I think back to the very beginning when Adam and Eve sin, and they're confronted with their sin, this inward reality that now lives within them. And what do they do? They go immediately for outward decorations. Fig leaves and hiding and running away from God. This is the story of humanity. Outward decorations that conflict with inward realities. And what I love so much about the arrival of Jesus is he confronts all of that. He enters into the inward realities. He enters into the prison cell underneath all of the outward decorations and offers us a way out, offers us liberation, offers us freedom. And so what I want to do today is I want to take you back to the verse that we just read, Isaiah 53, verses 2 and 3. And this is where we're going to kind of be living a little bit in this series is Isaiah 53. And uh, I just want to read this over us here this morning as we frame our time together. For he, Jesus, grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Nearly a thousand years before Jesus is born, the prophet Isaiah writes these words about this mysterious servant who would come as Israel's promised Messiah. And what I love about his description here is that he had none of the markers of outward decoration. None of them. He had none of the outward indicators that the world looks for in trying to assess whether or not somebody is worth listening to, whether or not someone is worth following. He had none of the 
outward royalty, none of the outward power, none of the outward success. Nothing about Jesus when looking at him screamed outward decoration. Isn't it ironic? I just find this so ironic that the most decorated season of the year is designed to celebrate an undecorated Messiah. Think about that contrast. Think about how stark that is. See, the world celebrates outward decorations, but it doesn't just say in this text that Jesus didn't have beauty, right? It says that there. He didn't have beauty. He didn't have form that was attractive to him, but he also didn't have majesty. He didn't have majesty. He didn't have money. He didn't have connections. He didn't have credentials. He didn't have any of the stuff that you need to make it in this world. Like, if you've heard the the story of Jesus' birth as told in the Gospels, I mean, this is just time and time again, these Gospel writers are hitting these points. He was born into a world that did not make room for him, right, to an impoverished family who had to go to the temple and offer turtle doves, which is basically just the Bible's way of saying they were dirt poor because they couldn't afford lamps. Within the first couple years of his life, there is a uh, murderous and fragile king that forces his family out of their home to flee as refugees to Egypt, where he spends time. And then when he finally does come back home, right, he, he's raised as an impoverished carpenter in this painfully ordinary place called Nazareth. And when you hear carpenter, like a lot of us today think of like tradesmen, like We have some really talented carpenters here in our church. That's not what Jesus was, okay? He didn't deal in, like, rich mahogany and epoxy and black walnut, right? I'm looking at you, Rob. Jesus was a day-laboring, impoverished carpenter. It's very different than, like, the skilled trade that you would think of today. This is Jesus. In fact, there's one point in the Gospels where Jesus returns to his hometown, Nazareth, and nobody listens to him. They just basically say, aren't you Mary's son? Aren't you the carpenter's boy? Why? Because there was a veil of ordinariness around Jesus. He did not have the outward decorations. Here's the miracle, though. This is the Christmas miracle of Jesus' incarnation or his arrival. And when I use the word incarnation, maybe that's not a a word you're familiar with. That basically just means that the God of the universe became flesh in the person of Jesus. He arrives, he is born. This is the miracle. For Jesus to be incarnated as God in the flesh means that God is finally seen by us. But not just seen, held and touched and loved and felt and here in the person. Now, if you are the God of the universe, the God who hung the stars in the sky, who spoke galaxies into existence, who told the sea you may come this far and no further, whose very face cannot be looked upon because of his beauty and his majesty, why would you arrive in the person of Jesus with none of that? Because Jesus arrived not to transform outward decorations, but to transform inward realities. That the power of the incarnation of Jesus Christ is that he did not show up as the most flashy, well-decorated, all-encompassing, attractive being there ever was with no risk or pain or rejection. No, he lived as a human in the same complicated world that you and I live in. Right? Jesus knew what it felt like to face rejection. His incarnation was not free of painful inward realities. He was misunderstood by his community. His family questioned his vocation and calling. The cultural leaders of his day called him the spawn of Satan. He had a best friend who betrayed him. Like Jesus knew what painful inward realities are like. And yet there's a lot of us here today who are living shackled because we haven't invited Jesus to transform those inward realities. We're content with the outer decorations. See, some of us believe that in order to come to God, we have to get all of the outward decorations right. We have to get all of the stuff that everybody else sees, whether it's the behavior or the image right, before we can actually come to God problem is that's not how God comes to us. 
That's not how Jesus arrives in any way, shape, or form. No beauty or majesty that would attract us to him. No outward decorations. None. Let me illustrate it this way. We, uh, this is our first year as a family in a while getting a fake Christmas tree. But normally, we're real Christmas tree people. How many of you are real Christmas tree people in here? Okay, a, a decent number of us. I'd say probably like in general, it's 50-50 for people. Uh, but I, I think every year of us going to get our real Christmas tree, right? And it is an ordeal. It is a process, right? So we go to the Christmas tree farm with three kids in tow and bottle of wine. No, I'm just kidding. Not that. Uh, and, and it takes hours to find the perfect Christmas tree, right? And we finally do and realize we forgot the saw back at the place and have to do all that. And we finally get it home and we get it set up in the room. And what do you have to do with a real Christmas tree all the time? Water it, right? Water it in hopes that it doesn't burst into flames, Clark Griswold style, <laughs> right? And then you just look at the thing the wrong way and all of the needles fall off. What is with our obsession with decorating dead things and pretending they're alive. Hmm? What is our obsession with outward decorations? Why are we so obsessed with this? And it's not just Christmas time. We do it all the time. Here's why I think it is. Because you can control outward decorations a lot more than you can control inward realities. In order to have inward realities like shame, and a need for approval and security met, you actually have to give up control. You actually have to surrender some things to one who actually can transform those things because I can't transform my inward realities. I can't do it. You have no power over your own life to transform your inward realities. You can control your outer decorations all you want. All of us can, and we do. But that's not what God is after. I want to speak just to a couple groups of people here uh, this morning. Women, there is a message that you are sent over and over again by our culture. And I heard a woman telling me this just this last week. That in order to be successful, you have to somehow do all of the things for everyone all the time. Right? That you have to somehow simultaneously run a business and raise perfect kids while homeschooling them and then do Zumba, right? And... Um, maintain a perfect house and perfect meals on the table and all of these things being juggled. And, oh, you should probably Instagram about it along the way, too, to make it look perfect, right? And then when you somehow drop one of those balls that you're expected to juggle, you believe that the deficiency is with you, not with the expectation that is placed on you for outer decorations. What an evil, evil lie from the enemy. And, And perfectionism is just the outward decoration for an inward need for approval. That's all it is. An inward need to know that I am accepted and loved as I am. So what do I do? I outward decorate, and I try to maintain this illusion of perfection, and it's just a facade. Men, (laughs) we're not off the hook either. The message that we are sent by our culture is some really really dangerous and evil messages about what it means to be a man. That to be a man, you have to have this illusion of strength all the time. And that if you actually need to depend on someone else, you're weak. And so what do you do? You just mask by getting angrier and louder and more physical and more aggressive Because you believe the lie that to actually need other people in your life is weakness. To actually open yourself up vulnerably around other guys, other people, is weakness. You know, narcissism is a huge issue for guys. Big time. And I think a lot of this comes from an outward decoration of just masking a deep fear of being ordinary or not having control. Outer decorations, we all do this. Jesus, Jesus wants nothing to do with our outer decorations without first transforming our inward realities. That's what he's interested in. That's what he's after. 
I even think of like in Matthew 6 when, he, when he's given the Sermon on the Mount and he's speaking and he goes through this whole list of things and he says like when you give to the poor or when you pray or when you fast, don't do it in a way that celebrates all of these outward decorations. Go to the secret place. Go to the place where nobody else knows and do those things there because I am so much more interested in transforming inward realities. You cannot buy my love by your outer decorations. You can't do it. Don't believe me? Let me show you how Jesus actually arrives in the world here. Going back to the scriptures, John chapter 1, verse 14, says this, And the word, which is just another way of saying Jesus, became flesh and dwelt among us. How did Jesus show up 2,000 years ago? As a little baby in Bethlehem, how was he incarnated 2,000 years ago? He was incarnated in the flesh as an ordinary, vulnerable, messy baby. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. How does Jesus show up in the world today, though? Like, how is Jesus incarnated in the world today? 2 Corinthians 12, 9 tells us. Paul says it this way. He says, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. I want to show you something really, really cool here. The words that are circled up there, dwelt among and rest upon, have the same exact Greek root of each other. I'm not going to go super in depth to the Greek because we're not nerds here, but uh, (laughs) the Greek word is essentially the same, and it means to tabernacle in to dwell within, to be with. And so what Paul is saying here is that Christ today is incarnated when his people confess the inward realities of our lives, that we boast in our weaknesses. Why? So that the power of Christ may dwell in us, may rest upon us. This is why, as a church, I am so obsessed with us being vulnerable and honest and weak and authentic because that is how the power of Christ is displayed in this community. That's how he shows up. He doesn't show up in our outer decorations. He shows up when his people are willing to confess and get honest about our inward realities and not hide those from each other. Jesus gets in the prison cell and he doesn't want your outward decorations. He actually wants you to Take those down. He wants to help you take those down. Jesus' love can't be bought with all of the things that the world celebrates. He wants you right now as you are. Not some future version cleaned up of you. Not some like, hey, this is in my past and you know, I'm, I'm perfect now. I'm all figured out. I'm not all perfect and figured out. None of us are. Jesus wants you right now, as you are. That's the good news. But if that good news is going to be good news for you, I have some bad news for you. If you want the good news of Jesus, that he wants you right now, as you are, there is some bad news that goes with it. And the bad news is this. If Jesus wants you right now the way you are, you have to be really honest about who you are right now. And that's what most of us are not willing to do. Most of us are not willing to do that deep internal work of saying, God, where have I used outward decorations to mask internal shame, internal need for security, these deep inner needs that I have that I'm just content with outer decorations for? And what is so powerful about the life of Jesus from the birth to his death is that every single step of the way, his invitation is come to me and I will help take those outer decorations off and transform the inward realities. There is no better place where you can see this happening than on his cross. In fact, I love, I just, this is one of my favorite quotes of all time from Pastor Tim Keller. He's an incredible author. This is what he says about Jesus. He says, Jesus didn't hang on a cross for you because you were lovely to him. No, he was in agony and he looked down at us denying him abandoning him and betraying him. Outward decorations all stripped away, right? Just us and him. 
with complete vulnerability, complete openness, Jesus hanging on a cross, naked and shamed and abused and wounded, hanging on the cross, captive by our sins. And he sees us. And he doesn't say, oh man, you are so beautiful to me. You are so lovely to me. He doesn't see the outer decorations. Tim Keller goes on and he says, and in the greatest act of love, when exposed to all of this, the greatest act of love in history, he stayed. He stayed. He loved us not because we were lovely to him, but to make us lovely. You know, a couple weeks ago, um, my wife, Sam, and I, we shared our broken marriage story. And uh, if you haven't listened to that message yet, maybe you're here and you're new, I, I encourage you to go listen to it. It was the November 6th teaching that we did. Um, but the short of it is that I've wrestled with my own sexuality my whole life. And uh, 30 years, I did not talk about it. I didn't expose anyone to the inner realities of my world. But I hung up a lot of decorations. A lot. Decorations that looked like image management, achievement, accumulation. And, and my wife and I, we went through the season of, of hell in our marriage. And she actually told me to show this picture because this was in the thick of it. We were so pissed off at each other in this picture. Like, so angry. Sorry, I'm not allowed to say that word on stage, but <laughs> we were so, like, in the middle of the thick of it, in the middle of a fight, and this was the, probably the fakest family picture that we have ever taken in our life, but nobody would know it. Outer decorations, inward realities. And one of the things that I've observed, like you name the decoration, chances are it's hung in my cell at one time or another. One of the things that I've observed, and I just wanna get really transparent, after sharing our story with you guys, just gives me so much hope for the church. Like just so much hope for what the community of Jesus can be. And so I just wanna say first and foremost, thank you for your love and your support and your witness, the stories that Sam and I have gotten to hear in this community, even in the last few weeks, have just blown our minds. But here's what I want to say. There's been kind of two pieces of pushback that we've gotten from sharing our story. And this is okay. Like, we, we knew this would come. God's transformed some inward realities for us, so we can handle it, okay? But the two main pieces of pushback that we've received are this. How dare you call your sexuality broken? That's what the world says. You cannot call your sexuality broken. Right? Keep your outer decorations up. Take them on as identity. Wear them for the world to see. Celebrate them. Take pride in your outer decorations. That's the first piece of pushback. The second piece of pushback, and this comes from, I would say, more religious-leaning people. This is, I think, more maybe the, the message of people in the church a lot of times, is this. Please just keep your outer decorations up. We don't want to see what's underneath the surface. We don't want to see that. We're, we're comfortable with our outward decorations here, and you keep your outward decorations out over there, and let's just, let's just stay in our prison cells together and just be perfectly content and perfectly happy. Here's the thing, if I can be really honest with you, there is a specific type of person that experiences healing in Christ. And it's the type of person that's willing to take down the outer pretense and the outer decorations and say, Jesus, this is really who I am. And I believe you can redeem it. I believe you can restore it. I believe you can do something with it. I don't even know what you're going to do with it, but I believe you can. Like this redemption thing, it's going to be a little bit more messy with me, right? How many of us have thought that or said that to Jesus? But I'm going to be honest about it. I'm going to name it. I'm going to subject my fear, myself to the risk of being rejected or hurt or let down by other people. 
but I'm not going to hide it. There are some of us here in this room today, some of us watching online, who have never been honest with God about how our outward decorations are masking our inside realities. So where is this happening for you? Like, where are your outward decorations masking inward realities? If you have any hope of freedom in Christ, it starts with getting really honest about this. Really honest with God, really honest with yourself, really honest with others. And if you're not willing to get honest about your outward decorations, God won't do anything to transform your inward realities. He wants to be invited in to that place. So am I willing to get honest? Like maybe for you, it's a deep need, a deep desire, a deep longing for acceptance. That you've experienced rejection so many different ways, so many different times in your life. And so you, in in the effort to, to have the deep inner need of acceptance met, have just settled for all kinds of outward decorations. Decorations like obsession with other people's approval. Like it's okay to care what other people think, but it's not okay to be controlled by it and manipulated by it and have your integrity compromised because of it. The message of Jesus is that come to me with your broken story, your broken pieces of your life, and I accept you, and I love you, and I will hold you, and I will transform that for you. Maybe for you it's image management that you have a shopping addiction or a makeup obsession, all in the ever-elusive pursuit of feeling lovely. To you, I would say, look at the cross. Jesus didn't die for you because you were already lovely for him. to him. He died for you because he wanted to make you lovely. Maybe for you, it's security or safety, and you've just found so much of this, an accumulation of money or stuff or positions or climbing the work ladder or whatever it might be. And for you, your deep need for security is met by just some outside decoration like money or a job. Maybe for you, it's peace. That your inward reality is just constant turmoil and angst and anxiety. And so what you've done is you've used escapism or substance abuse, or something like that to mask an inward reality of anxiety. Can I just say, freedom and escape are not the same things as each other. Jesus desires to unlock the door in your life and offer you freedom. It's not enough just to be honest and name our outward decorations. Jesus wants us to take those somewhere. He wants us to take them to him. He wants to transform them. He wants us to take them to other people in community. There's a men's group that meets here every single Monday night. There's multiple women's groups, one on Monday, one on Tuesdays, that meet here where we just spend time. I'm not in the women's group. I'm in the men's group. Uh, (laughs) Where we just spend time doing this. This is what's broken in my marriage right now. This is what's broken in my job situation right now. This is, this is where I am using outward decorations to mask inward realities. If you think this is just a female thing or a male thing and it doesn't apply to your, no. I, it, I see it across the board. We all do it. And the people that experience freedom are the ones who are daily willing to give up and surrender their inward realities for Jesus to transform. So what I want to do is invite the band up as we close. And uh, as we close here today, I was just kind of thinking through, like, how, how should we close uh, this service out? And uh, what I want to do is just kind of show you how Jesus' ministry actually began. Right? So he began his earthly ministry when he was 30 years old. We don't have a lot of details about the first 30 years of his life. But as his, his earthly ministry is beginning... His relative, John the Baptist, is the one that is kind of announcing him to the world. And he sees Jesus coming. And he says something about Jesus that had never been said before about sin. A new reality that Jesus' life was ushering in. And it's this statement right here. He says, Behold 
the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, what was so unique about that statement? Because for the first time in human history, sin was not being just covered or masked or outwardly decorated. The person of Jesus came to take it away. Like at best, the sacrificial system was just another way of of decorating, just another way of masking the deeper inner realities of our sin. But what John the Baptist, the announcement of Jesus introduces is his ability to remove it as far as the east is from the west. Freedom through and through and through. When we are willing to humble ourselves and just come to him and say, Jesus, this is what is in me. Not what I think ought to be in me that you like want to see in me, so I'm going to like dress my, nope. This is what is in me. I'm going to name it. I'm going to bring it to you. And every dang day of my life, I'm going to ask you to transform it. That's where he moves. That's where the power is. I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. So if you're here this morning, I wasn't even going to do this, but I'm, I'm going to go off script just a little bit. If you're here this morning and you've never taken hold of that freedom in your life, <laughs> maybe you've gone through the religious motions, you've been raised in church, Maybe you're here and your very first reaction is, ah, the pastor has ripped jeans on and that bothers me. We don't really do decorations around here, okay? But we do transformed inner realities. So if you're here this morning and and that's something you want to take hold of, you want to bring your inward realities to Jesus, I'm going to just pray a prayer, offer a prayer up, and I just want to invite you to, to pray this in your heart silently. To pray this alongside of me as we invite Jesus to transform inner realities in our lives. So Jesus, thank you. Thank you for your birth. Thank you for your life. Thank you for your death. And thank you for your resurrection. Jesus, I have have decorated my life for the world to see. But today I acknowledge that you are the only one who can transform inner realities. That Jesus, you are the only one who can get a hold of a heart and bring true and lasting peace, true and lasting security, true and lasting hope, And so, Jesus, today I confess that I am a sinner and I ask you to be my Savior. Because you're the only one who can bring dead things back to life. So, this morning I pray this in Jesus' name.